to you all here. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us worship God. Let us join in prayer. God of the changing seasons, God of the changing moods of nature, God of the shifts and transitions within each of us, Lord, lead us in our worship, lead us in our serving, lead us in our living. Help us to worship you in this time together in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us rise and join in the call to worship. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Lead me in your truth and teach me. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Long ago, Isaiah told that God would send a Messiah to lead God's followers. The people waited many years, looking forward to the coming of the promised one. As we begin this season of Advent, we remember how faithfully God keeps God's promises to us. We look forward to the joy of Christmas as we make plans in our homes and church for the celebration of Jesus' birth. Why do we light one candle? This candle reminds us of the light of hope that the prophets had in their expectation of the Messiah who would bring peace and love to the world. Let us pray. Loving God, we are excited about Christmas coming again. We thank you for sending Jesus into the world. As we prepare our homes for the holidays, Help us to prepare also, prepare ourselves also to receive Jesus. Keep us kind and thoughtful. When we are selfish and want things for ourselves, remind us that Jesus had only a crib in a stable when he came. Amen.
Let us join in the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts and minds, O Lord, to receive your holy word. By your Spirit's recreative power, change us as you will. We offer our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, reading at verse 14. Listen for God's word to us. The days surely are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. Our New Testament lesson from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1 at verse 5. Listen for God's word to us. The gospel according to Luke is the gospel for us. It's the gospel for Gentiles with no particular Jewish background. Notice uh, Luke, for instance, has two angels at the resurrection. Now, two angels, two. Oh, and I need to be clear about this. Uh, not just two, but two men are legal testimony in court. So we need to be clear about that. Therefore, it would seem like there should be two angels appearing to Zechariah. Except that Zechariah is the high priest, or functioning as priest at the uh, on his watch, going into the Holy of Holies. Therefore, when an angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah in the Holy of Holies, it's not public. Zechariah is the only one who sees. Zechariah, being a religious person, now, <clears throat> you know, I would recognize an angel if I saw one in church when I was practicing a sermon, right? Sure. So we don't need two to convince Zechariah. We just need to get Zechariah's attention and get him to listen to what the angel has to say. God's word for Zechariah. So the angel's going to relay this to him. In verse 13, the record is that the angel tells Zechariah that his wife Elizabeth is going to bear him a son. Now, that word bear in verse 13 is a extension of the word for Genesis, a beginning. Notice how Luke, the Gentiles, plays with John on the theological gospel, not a biography, a theology of what Jesus has done for us <clears throat> and among us. What does it mean? What's it all about? Okay. Theological gospel. John starts out, in the beginning, God was the word, word was with God, the word was God. Genesis begins, in the beginning, God created, and it was by the word. God said, let there be light, and there was light, let the waters be separated from the dry land, and it was so. God saw that it was good. Well, God ordered it, sure, it was good, not an issue. John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was what brought about creation. So John's telling us that 
in the birth of the Christ, God is redoing creation. It's going to be a new creation without a mess up in the garden with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the serpent and all that. This time it's going to go right. God's made up God's mind and God has spoken and it will be so and it will be good. Luke is reinforcing what John is saying. God is doing a new creation in Christ, which Paul picks up that expression in one of his letters uh, <clears throat> later on the, uh, in the new church, birthing of the new church, Christian community, developing later in the New Testament. God, uh, Paul talks about a new, being a new creation in Christ, individually, each one of us. John says that that's going to be done universally, at least available universally, for all creation. Elizabeth will bear you a son, and that will be the beginning of your family and the beginning of the paving of the way for the coming of the Christ. It's the foundation of the new creation. <clears throat> Let's listen to the record. In the days of King Herod of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and the regulations of the Lord. But they had no children. Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once when Zechariah was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to Zechariah, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink, even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and the power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this will be so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe in your heart my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day that these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived 
for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace that I have endured among my people. Here ends the gospel reading. This is God's holy word that can be trusted. There appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. In the name of our Creator, our Redeemer, and God's loving presence, let us pray. O Lord, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things in your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The angel appeared to Zechariah in the Holy of Holies. Well, where else is going to an angel going to show up for crying out loud? It's going to be in the temple, in church. And it's going to be in the sanctuary. Of course. I mean, why is God going to show up to somebody in the boiler room? Yeah. Going to do it in the right place. But how often do we come to this? Oh, yeah, it's going to be when any one of us happens to decide to come into the sanctuary to pray. Now, you know things are pretty desperate at that point, so therefore it's a good time for an angel to show up, confirming that God is listening, will hear, and is going to respond. No question about it. Emmanuel, God with us. Well, we can't see God face to face. Nobody sees God face to face and lives, says Scripture. Therefore, when God speaks to one of us directly, it's going to be through a messenger, some being carrying God's Word to us so that we can listen, see that there is someone bringing a message, and know for sure that God is with us, recognizes us, and pays attention. God hears, and God answers. An angel simply is a messenger from God. 
one angel bringing a word to Zechariah, a piece of really good news. We just hope that his health insurance was paid up because he was going to have some expenses with the birth of John. Here we are, unexpected event, out of step event, unusual. No wonder God sent a messenger. And not monkeying around, Gabriel no less, to bring the word of something so unusual. Elizabeth, in her more mature years, is going to bear a child. But then this has happened before, hasn't it? This is not the first time that God has done something crazy. Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament, a long time before that, also childless. And Abraham's descendants will be numberless as the sands of the seashore. Miracle. Unexpected, highly irregular, but dependable, and it happened. Gabriel wasn't the one who brought the word to uh, Abraham. Well, of course. Remember, Sarah was uh, sitting or standing or holding the tent flap a little bit open so she could hear what was going on. And yeah, the men, of course, were having the conversation, and Sarah was outside eavesdropping. Two strangers had dropped by and, of course, needed to be offered a meal and hospitality. Two strangers brought word that Sarah would bear a child in mature years to Abraham, father, in mature years. And the ones who had been childless would parent generations to come. The new house of Israel. What an unusual word. As unusual as the word to Zechariah in the temple. Totally strange, totally out of step, totally unexpected. As were, of course, the two visitors dropping in on Abraham and Sarah. Now, they didn't look like angels, those visitors. They looked like you, like me, you know, normal people. Well, at least I try to look normal and act normal, but, you know, when you're a preacher, it's very hard to look normal and act normal. Normal pe travelers and their Enterprise rental car had broken down. and they were, I mean, the camel had gotten hungry and uh, was tired and needed a rest, so they stopped by for lunch and then brought good news, kind of a reward, a blessing, a gift from God. There it was. Messengers from God, angels, who look very regular and seem very, and talk regular. They, they don't talk in um, old Elizabethan English and look holy, you know. They are, they're pretty straight folks. And in conversation over a meal, Abraham finds out that God has massive plans and massive dreams and a massive future for Abraham and Sarah and for Israel. Emmanuel, God with us, even before the advent of the Christ,
Well, there have always been angels around, haven't there? You know, when we were in the school, there would be at least one or two angels in the class. We call them teacher's pets. They were not necessarily the favorite kids in the class. They usually sat in the front, and uh, those of us who wanted to survive tried to sit in the back as much as we could, or behind somebody who was very much larger than we were and therefore could kind of hide behind I mean, his survival tactics in class. Everybody looking pretty much normal. Even the angels in the class looked normal pretty much. They generally were clean and a little better dressed than most of us were, but they, they sort of looked like everybody else pretty much. They didn't act like everybody else. You couldn't tell them by looking at them, but you could tell them by how they acted and how they talked. And we knew that they were angels. Well, according to Abraham and Sarah's experience, angels don't necessarily look different. They're very much like us. What makes an angel? Somebody in a prayer chain speaking for? Somebody from a prayer chain bringing a message that prayers are going to God on behalf of. And somebody that we know is a messenger from God. Bearing God's promise, God's word, an angel. doesn't quite make sense, does it, yet? Some years ago, Saturday night, I had just settled down for a long winter's nap when over on the nightstand there arose such a clatter that I sat bolt upright, reached for the phone, Picked it up, thought, well, I'll just slam it back down. No, I'd better not slam it back down again. Even 12.45 a.m., Saturday night, and there's a thing called church on Sunday morning. And obviously, my nap was a bit broken up. Good thing I answered. Trying to sound awake. <laughs> Oh, good morning, this is Jake. At least I think it was. And what, good thing I answered, it was an elder from the church session. He'd been sent out of town by his company. He was out of town for the weekend because the meetings had uh, bridged over the weekend. And he had a crisis. Could I please go to the hospital? 12.45 a.m. on Saturday night. Well, what happened? The son had tonsillitis and was going to have his tonsillitis. He was going to have his head, and not, not get a heart transplant, not even getting his appendix out, uh, he, it, it was a tonsillectomy. The kid was going to get to eat more ice cream than I would have for the next month, and there we are. And I'm supposed to give up an ice cream. You know, this preacher stuff is not all it's cracked up to be sometimes. Well, well, Dennis, uh, is, is something wrong? Is he getting infection? Or No. Son is having a tonsillectomy, but Mama is very upset because her little boy is going to undergo the knife. And I, uh, the, the boy is doing fine. He's anticipating the ice cream. Mama is going, I've got to get to the hospital because Dennis can't get there. 
and the wife needs some support. Okay, I understand. I'll get there in 15 minutes. No shower, throw on the clothes from uh, the day, and over to the hospital. Uh, spent probably 45 minutes, maybe an hour there, talking with the son and with mom, and uh, letting him know that dad was concerned and wished he could be there, but, uh, and we had prayer, and at somewhere around 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I settled down for a short winter's nap. Probably one of the few times that I could be considered an angel. Kind of like the travelers who visited Sarah and Abraham. It was just Jake, you know, the pastor, responding to the elder and his son's not feeling good and mom's crisis. Well, I didn't have good news that the tonsillectomy was going to disappear and not have to happen. However, the church cared, dad cared, dad was aware, pastor cares, and God cares. God knows. God understands son's needs, will guide the surgeon, and by the way, God will be beside mom waiting for the results. God is faithful. God is Angels, messengers from God coming to us in God's name at God's direction, usually with a nudge or somehow a tap on the shoulder from the Holy Spirit. Hey, go, speak for me. The common mythology is that uh, folks die and go to heaven and become angels floating around heaven somewhere or other. There was a wonderful cartoon, and, uh, yeah, it was in New Yorker magazine some years ago. Uh, it showed uh, clouds and some angels around there, and two angels are central on the big cloud, and they've got a box open that says harp on the cover. And on the edge of the cover box, it says, some assembly required. That doesn't sound like heaven to me. I, I hope I don't have to put the widgets or fasten together somehow the strings on. Oh, and by the way, having taken piano lessons without the, some grand results, I hope I don't have to take harp lessons when I get to heaven, assuming I'm going to get there. I would prefer that the transition be much easier. And by the way, have you noticed that every time an angel appears, when we encounter an angel in Scripture, Old Testament with travelers with Abraham and Sarah, Gabriel with Zechariah and the Holy of Holies, the angel speaks talks, stands, moves, has living being. I suggest to you that we don't die to become angels. We live to be angels, messengers of the Word from God. I have heard the prayers of your concern from the prayer chain. Travelers speaking to Abraham and Sarah. There's no indication 
that Gabriel in the Holy of Holies in the presence of Zechariah was white feathered and strangely equipped with wings. The un indefinite, unspecified kind of appearance of Gabriel was very much like one of us. Somebody else on the team that was on duty that day, but identified himself as uh, Gabriel, so Zechariah knew, and very much alive very much not in heaven, very much in the Holy of Holies, on earth, in front of Zechariah, looking very human and regular. And Zechariah knew when the identification was made, I am, Zech I am Gabriel, then it was someone different. Zechariah knew, but he needed to be told. There was no name tag, no badge, apparently no wink. Very much like some of those folks who appeared at the resurrection. A young man was sitting in the tomb, dressed in white, otherwise looking pretty normal. We don't have to die to become angels. We can serve God here. In the words of that hymn, just as I am. Remember that uh, grand quote that I heard years ago from my fundamentalist friend, the only availability, the only ability that God needs is availability. And we can have that, we can be that, we can do that. Alive, well, in this place, not just as four walls and a ceiling and a floor, but in Homer and beyond, wherever. Angels, messengers from God, God's presence, so we can see and hear and in our terms know God loves that much, loves enough to let God's word be seen and heard. The messenger seen the message understandable. And God loves you and me enough to let us do it. What a calling. We can live to be angels here to God's glory. A meeting of the Congregation and Corporation of Homer First Presbyterian Church has been called for this morning to hear two motions from the session. This is the final announcement of the meeting and it will be conducted in probably less than five minutes at the conclusion of worship. Is there any other news of a mission and ministry of First Church? Eldon Winchell, they have an anniversary this week. And also, we need to remember, I believe I'm correct, Rick Davis has a birthday. Thank you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. 
Happy anniversary, dear Charlotte. Happy anniversary to you. You may have seen an announcement about poinsettia order forms. Um, the forms are not in your bulletin, but they are on the table at the back. They're yellow if you would like to purchase one. Also, we need Advent candle lighters for the 19th and for Christmas Eve. So please sign your family up to help celebrate the birth of Christ. Thank you. Just a reminder to please get your stewardship envelopes in as soon as possible so we have an idea of what the next year is going to bring. Thank you. Okay, are there joys and concerns to share? Uh, right side aisle, right center, left center, left outside. We are, we are there. Let us unite in prayer. Lord God, God of each one of us, God of the universe, even beyond what we know, thank you for those moments when you have spoken to your people Thank you for moments when you have spoken to those who are not yours, yet have brought them into your service. We remember the amazing record of your work in creation. Lord, help us to be part of it in this generation and in this place. Guide us, use us, speak through us, work through us. We pray for each of the people mentioned, each of the joys, the happiness, the needs, concerns, things that are beyond our control and help. Lord, touch each as you know, and as you will. Help each person and each situation to sense your closeness. Help us, observing from a distance, to see your work, recognize your miracles, to understand your love. Where we pray for a confused world, that too is beyond us. Help us to relax enough to trust you. Guide our leaders, guide us in following. Lord, help us to be not only one nation under God, but one nation for God among the other nations of the world. We pray for our nation. Lord, there are so many stresses, so much uh, disconnect, so much that seems out of joint. Let your wisdom prevail. Let your recreative power be at work. Lord, touch institutions, touch individuals. Help us to remain calm and clear through the process. Be with our church and pastor transition. Lead us in your direction. Lord, let your plans come about for us. Let your dreams be real. Let what you will become by your spoken word created among us for Jesus' sake. Hear our prayers. Hear us as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A meeting of the congregation for, uh, has been called for this Sunday morning, this time, this place. The meeting is called to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, are, is there a quorum present? Thank you. I have yet to hear a no, and I am not going to ever hear a no, right? <laughs> so the meeting is called to order. Let us join in prayer. Lord, there always are decisions to be made. Guide our thinking. Fill us with your wisdom. Give us your courage, your energy, your direction. In Jesus' name, amen. Madam Clerk, uh, what is the first motion on the floor? And the first motion is to allow a session to meet virtually by Zoom when it appears appropriate to do so. Permission for the session and other committees as needed uh, to meet by Zoom. Since there's a session motion, it does not require a second. Is there any question or discussion? Ready to vote. Is it? Uh, digital uh, virtual meeting. Virtual, I think, is the umbrella term. I, I still have to learn new language, but yeah. Ver yes, thank you. Ready to vote. All in favor, aye. Opposed? So ordered. The second is to confirm our church's mission statement. To be a church that lives by faith, is known by love and is a voice of hope to the community. Thank you. There's a session motion. It does not require a second. Uh, is there any discussion or question? Ready to vote. All in favor, aye. Opposed? Ah, oh, if the kingdom of God were always like this. <laughs> Thank you. Let us join in prayer. Lord, thank you for new ideas, new opportunities, new expressions of your grace and your presence. Let your love surround us. Let your spirit inspire us. Let your courage motivate us. In Jesus' name, amen. Is there a motion to adjourn? Support? All in favor, aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Good. Thank you. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace.